Amen. If you would go ahead and uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And, uh, Matthew chapter 5. And when, you, when you're there, say there. Anybody else? There. 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 All right. All right. I want to make sure you're patient. Um, we're going to pick it up here in uh, verse 17. And uh, so here, here's the setting. Uh, we're at the Sermon on the Mount. Who is speaking? Jesus is speaking. Our Lord and Savior, right? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is speaking. Like, verbally out of his mouth. If you have a red letter Bible, what color are these letters? They're red, right? They're red for about three chapters because it's him speaking. And uh, so, again, we're, it's a joy to be going through this with you. But here he is in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, on the Sermon on the Mount. As he's teaching us, this is what he says. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is Accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You guys think this is an easy passage? <laughs> Good, because maybe you'll have grace on me um, as I try to bring some clarity for us here um, today. Uh, I pray for that. Others have prayed that uh, as well. And, uh, and so we've asked the Holy Spirit to uh, help me teach and to help you understand. It's a good plan, right? Because <laughs> that's the way it should be every week. And that really, that's the way it is every week. But little emphasis today. Um, so before we get any further, since Jesus is talking about the law, I thought it would be really great if I let these guys from the Bible Project explain to us what the law is. So let's just watch this video for just a few minutes. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible. Stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first ten. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, am I supposed to obey some of these, all of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing, because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. And so some of the laws that are about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. Other laws are about social justice or morality. And by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just a complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, no, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention, because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. If don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. And yeah, they worship the golden calf. And so Moses gives some more laws. And then you get more stories of rebellion. 
some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just going to continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new, transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land... They break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's Spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now, in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that Story, So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem, and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there, to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command, that we are to love God and to love God. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect, when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus shows how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a dead But where Israel failed, Jesus brought the story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others. And he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's Spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets. Or in the words of the Apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. This video... That's some good help, don't you think? Yeah. A little crash course there on uh, the main subject matter of this morning. There we go. Put new batteries in this thing today. Maybe it's too powerful. I don't know. But uh, but yeah, it's going to help us when we because when we talk about the law and the prophets, it's good to understand what it, what exactly is he talking about. That kind of gives us a background, so we know every time that the law and the prophets is mentioned, we know now what it's referring to as we get to that uh, in the study. And so we, we also have to take this, this part of the sermon in, the, in context of what it is. Because remember, you guys, we've already been through the Beatitudes, right? This is the, the character and the traits that we're supposed to have because these are God's character and traits. And we've already uh, talked about that we are to be salt and light in this world. Like, that's what we, as God's people, that's who we are chosen. That's, a, that's a, our identity uh, in this world. We are to be uh, those things. And so we've already talked about that. So in light of those things, now Jesus is going is telling us that no one is above the law. I mean, that's really what he's making this statement. No one is. You know what? That Jesus, even though technically he is the above the law, and we can get at that because he's the author, but yet when he was here, he, oh, you know, he obeyed every part of the law. So why sometimes as Christians do we think we don't? That's, that's just, I, that, 
it's just the, ob the, the obvious question that's coming from today, right? Is if, is if I am a follower of Christ and I am supposed to be like him, don't you think that that would include some of the things that he did or all of the things that he did? All of the things? Right. So, so again, we would want to emulate that. Now, there's going to be some cultural things that we don't do because we're not Jewish, right, that Jesus participated in because he was Jewish. But morally, morally, should we do the things that Jesus did? Yes, absolutely uh, we should. And so that's what this passage is saying. In verse 17, Jesus says these words, Do not think that I've come to ab abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So abolish means this, to formally put it into. That's what abolish means, to formally put it into. Did Jesus come to formally put it into the law? No. No. Not according, not according to his works here. He did not. Fulfill means this, though, to bring to completion, to achieve. All right? So that's what he came to do, not to formally end it, but to complete it. Because the law by itself, which we saw in the video, was incomplete. It was incomplete. And so it, 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 it was designed to point towards Jesus and his completion process. Okay? That's what the whole design was for. In Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, Paul tells the Romans this. He says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, <laughs> what weakened the law? Your flesh. Why did it weaken the law? Because of your flesh, you and I could not keep it. That's the whole idea. So the law itself is not weak. We are the ones that are weak. It is weakened by the flesh. Could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he uh, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So what you and I cannot do, could not do, could never have done since the beginning of time, Jesus came and did. We could not please God. We could not live up to the standards of God, all right? which, is, which is a perfect standard, right? It's perfection. That is God. God is perfection. And that's his desire for us. But we could not do that on our own. Does that mean God hated us? No. Because we could, no. It's the opposite. He loved us. And so he came and did it for us through the person of Jesus Christ. We're getting the gospel here. This is the gospel. We're talking about the law. So in keeping the law and living a perfect life, Jesus fulfilled the moral law. All right? And in his sacrificial death, Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial laws. That's why you didn't bring a lamb to slaughter today when you came to church. <laughs> because the lamb has already been slaughtered, right? right. Jesus Christ. You know, uh, it, it's, it's not ironic to me, but like, so again, this is reality. So while Jesus is honored, while he's preaching this sermon, sacrifices are still going on at the temple. People are still bringing. That stuff's still happening. You know what happened uh, just like 30 years or 30, 30 to 40 years after Jesus' death and burial resurrection? Sacrifices stopped altogether. What? They've been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden, around 40 years after the death, when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, the sacrifices stopped. And they just excused it. Oh, well. Jesus. You know the real reason? Yeah. It's because Jesus was the sacrifice. There was no need for them anymore. Do, do you think that the people who destroyed the temple put a stop to that? Or do you think God put a stop to that? Absolutely he did. Absolutely he put a stop to that. He's like, look. Okay, that was the point to Jesus. Look, he's already come. He's already been the sacrifice. We're not doing this anymore. We have those still t 
today, though, that are trying to bring that system back. They're working hard because they don't recognize the Lamb of God. So Jesus did not come to destroy the old religious system, but to build upon it by finishing the old covenant and establishing the new. All right? So the law was never to produce righteousness in us. That's, the pro that's not what it was to do. In fact, the law was given to reveal unrighteousness in us. The sin in us. Uh, without the law, you and I could not even recognize that we are a sinner. Which is essential for salvation. Essential for eternal life. You have to come to that place in your life where you realize that. Amen. That there is, there is no hope for you apart from Jesus Christ. So the problem was, though, is that people were keeping the law in order to make themselves righteous. They would keep the law to make themselves appear to be righteous. And I know that we're not in our heads, but I, sometimes I wonder if we're much different. Well, we appear to be doing one thing, but we're actually doing another. Or we appear to be Christians and following Christ, and, and we appear to do certain, but yet, in reality, we come, we come, and when we're around certain people, we act one way, when we're around other people, we act a different way. You know, I had a person that I, uh, that the church, actually you guys, you didn't know it, but you helped out a lady and a, her daughter this week, and uh, with, some, uh, with some shelter and some food. And, um, but in talking with that lady, uh, she uh, mentioned to me that she no longer goes to church. You want to know why? Hypocrites, right? Yeah. It, 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 even though she didn't recognize that she was one, but yet she did recognize that. And, and why is that? It's, beca it's because of this. It's because <laughs> we are doing this very big thing. We, we appear... As if we have arrived. That was the word I used in Sunday school today, so I'm going to reuse it. It's not in one, but that we appear that we have arrived when, when the truth is, is that none of us have arrived. Right? None of us will arrive until we're with Christ. Right? Until that work is completed. That's what it means when the completed work is done. So that when he says that not any of it will disappear until the completed work, that will be the completed work. When I am like him is what the Bible says. I will be like him. So you haven't arrived until then. So if you're one of those who act like it, stop. Just stop. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. Galatians chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. Paul writes to the Galatian church about this thing, about Jesus Fulfilling the law, he says, <clears throat> Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believe in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Is that, is that clear enough? That's pretty clear. He goes, he goes on to say, but, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For though the law, through the law, I'm sorry, sorry. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And, uh, get, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So again, if, we, we've had this discussion before. It's not that the law is bad. In fact, the law is very good. It, it describes the character of God. It describes the, the order that he placed things in here on earth. The, he actually gave us a border, right? He gave us a boundary by giving us the laws. And he's like, stay within this boundary, please. Stay within this boundary. That's what, that, that boundary. 
boundary of what? Protection. A boundary of love. So again, it's not that the law was bad. But the, the problem with the law is that it does not produce righteousness. Which is the standard of God. It's what he demands from us. It's to be holy and perfect. And the law cannot do that. It cannot do that. You guys saw that on the video. The more laws, the more what? Rebellion. Right? The more laws, the more rebellion. And, uh, and it, that, is, that is true. <laughs> The more, the, more, the more times that I can mess up, guess what? The more times I'm going to mess up. Right? right? I mean, so that's really the reality uh, of, of those things. So righteousness does not come through the law, but by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? That's where righteousness comes from. But Paul then raises this question in Romans chapter 3. He just mentioned in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? I mean, that, that we know that. Romans 3.23, it's there. He's letting everybody know, hey, no, again, nobody has arrived, right? We just say, that's, that's his, his version of nobody has arrived is for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's it. All right, and that we're in need of a Savior, and that Savior comes through faith. But then he says in, in verse 31 of Romans chapter 3, he says, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? What does he say? <laughs> by no means! With an exclamation point, he said. On the contrary, it's just the opposite of that. We uphold the law. It's just, it's just a, the, uh, a, a opposite way of thinking than what, was the, than what was being thought by the religious leaders at the time. They thought that by keeping the law, that's what made them righteous. And it's wrong. We are made righteous through Christ, therefore we keep the law. Now we're in the right order. You see, God's about order a lot of times. About order of things. And we can't get that out. We can't get that wrong. Because we get that wrong, then we get God wrong. Right? Paul later in Romans speaks of the law and teaches us to follow in Jesus' footsteps in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. This is, this is what he says, and they, they talked about it in the video as well. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment. Well, he's like, I'm stop, I'm, I'm stop making a list. Any other commandment you can think of. Right? That's what he's saying. Any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfillment, is the fulfilling of the law. So that even changes it even more for me. Now I've got other motivation to obey the law. Other than God who made the law made me righteous. So not only that, now I've got other motivation. What's my other motivation according to Paul? You are. You are. I obey God's law because I love you. Which if you keep on reading God's law means I love myself too. If you keep reading the word. But that's the other motivation. You know, I, I say this to the men's group all the time. You're not showing up for you. And if you, think, if you think that that's your mindset, that's why you don't come. You show up for the guy sitting across the table. It's about them. What, why do we say that? Because that's what the Word of God says. You do these things out of love for each other. I'm a murderer because I love you. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm not an adulterer because I love my wife. Not because I'm afraid of the consequences, right? That's, not, that's a bad motivation. Because we, don't control, we can't control that. 
Right? We can't control consequences. Because there's sometimes we're going to do bad things and we get away with it, right? And what does that lead us to do? More bad things. It can't be about consequences. It can't be about that. And, and, and we're being clearly communicated that through God's word that it has to be, my motivation has to be love. Why? Because that was Christ's motivation. That was his reason. He was a perfect example of that. So now that's my reason. Is that I love you. Verse 18. Oh goodness. We got a long ways to go. Verse 18. Here we go. Jesus goes on to say, for truly. What do you think that means? <laughs> this, for real. This is the truth. Right? Take it to the bank. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Which we talk about that. What's all is accomplished is when you and I are in eternity. Right? That's when all is accomplished. When you and I get there. Now I'd like to point out that these two words, iota and dot are not referring to the punctuation used in the King James Version of the Bible. Some of you have been taught that, I'm sure. That's not what this means. Um, we're talking about the original Hebrew language uh, that the Torah and the prophets were written in. Iota is actually uh, the translation for Yud. I got a chuckle from somebody from the ladies group. They understand what yud is, right? Or yud, yud hey vav hey, right? Yud hey. So the yud is the picture of the hand and the arm. That's the picture of it. It's also the, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So now this makes sense. So not even the smallest word. Or letter of the Hebrew alphabet will go away. And then if that wasn't enough, he goes on to say, uh, not even a dot, right? Yeah. Not a dot will pass away. Well, a dot just means this. It's the slightest stroke of a pen. So even if somebody was writing and a little bitty mark showed up in their writing, that, that, that ain't going away. It's there. It's permanent. It's talking about how the word of God is permanent. All, that should, all of this understanding should make us be, be uh, aware, beware of churches who are New Testament only churches. They're incomplete. They're 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 disobeying this. And I don't, I don't care how famous they are, how big they are, doesn't make them right. Jesus is very clear. Amen. It's all important. Jesus knows and his, he is teaching us that without the Old Testament, there is no New Testament. By the way, there's no another testament of Jesus Christ. That church is not a church at all. What this is telling us is that until Christ return, the law is still the law. It's still the way things work. It's still the way God designed things to be. And if you and I want to be into that, then we would do well to obey. In Luke uh, chapter 16, verse 17, it's phrased like this. Jesus says in Luke, but it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. It's easier for him to wipe out creation than to change the law. So why doesn't it become void? Why doesn't the law become void? It's just this simple thing. It's because it's the word of God. Amen. It's the word of God sure. on which you and I stand. Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will what? 
not pass away. My words won't. They're forever. Isaiah 40 verse 8 that Peter also quotes in 1 Peter 1.25 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand how long? Forever. 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 In Psalm 119, one verses 160. Yes, you heard me right. Psalm 119, verse 160. The sum of your word is truth, the psalmist says to God, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Forever. I want you guys to remember. Forever. Again, I know I've mentioned this, but this is a good time to remind you that the law is important because it's the very character of God. It is His holy standards. And for us to ignore them would be ignoring God. For us to, to think them not important is to think God is not important. And if we are not following them, are we truly following God? By the way, if you didn't know this about Psalm 119, it has 176 verses. Somebody said that's a lot. It's the longest single chapter in the Bible. And it is dedicated to loving and obeying God's law. I encourage you to read it. It is also an expansion of Psalm 19, which I would like to read a few verses from. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Just listen to the heart of the person writing this about the law of God. This is what he says. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. Some of you need that today, right? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. I, I don't know about you. I'm just wondering what would happen in my life. What would happen in Steve's life? If I read these verses every day, if I really acted like, treated people like, thought like this, verse 19 of Matthew 5, Jesus goes on to say, therefore, Because of all these truths about the law, because it's the character of God, because it is forever, because it endures, because there's never no ending to it, because it is good. He says there, Jesus says in verse 19, therefore, whoever, who is that? Whoever, you name them, whoever, all right, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But for whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I want you to be thinking right now that that you will have a heavenly t-shirt, right? With the word great on it, right? Or the word uh, least, That's not what this means. Some of you remember when we were studying 1 Corinthians about rewards in heaven. We talked extensively about that. For those who won't, I just want to give us a little reminder. 
this morning as well as a review for those who were. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through uh, 15. Paul talking about building on the foundation of Christ. This is what he says. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives... He will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Amen. So now we have described here in 1 Corinthians, we have the great, those that we call great in the kingdom of heaven, and those that will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. So we have here two, two different things, gold, silver, precious stones, and then we have wood, hay, and stubble. So one group would be refined by fire, the other group would be what? Burned up, right? Be burned up, there's nothing left. So you and I can find, this is really easy, you and I can find wood, hay, and stubble in our backyards. And it would not take too much effort to pick it up, right? Some of you may disagree because it's pretty hot outside, right? <laughs> But in, in reality, it wouldn't take much effort to pick those things up. But if we want gold, silver, and jewels, we would have to search and research and explore and dig. And it would be hard work. Right? It would be hard work keeping the commandments. And it will be hard work keeping the commandments of God. And uh, here in 1 Corinthians it says, the day will disclose it. This is the judgment seat of Christ, the 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So this judgment is not the great white throne judgment that we read in Revelation 20. This isn't the judgment of the nations as described in Matthew 25. And this is not the St. Peter judgment where he is at the gate of heaven going through a checklist to determine whether you get in or not. And that's because that doesn't exist. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's mainly because, again, there's no such thing as that. But you guys, again, you guys know that. The per this particular judgment, though, is known as the judgment seat of Christ where Christ judges the works, the behavior. Of the people and then rewards them for their works. There is no condemnation here, and no one at this judgment will be sent to hell. Okay? So we're not talking about that kind of judgment. So again, when Jesus is talking about following the law, it's not a heaven or hell issue. Right? I and mean, that's that's what he's saying. But that doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, if that's where you want to live, if you want to live on the, on, the, on the borderline of heaven and hell, okay, or on the fence or whatever, uh, hey. <laughs> there's not much peace there, I'm just going to tell you that. There's not much peace there. And what a big gamble, right? What a big gamble. Romans 8, chapter 1, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there's no condemnation here. The judgment seat of Christ will be when every man's work will be revealed and tested. In Romans 14, 12, it tells us that. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then he goes on to say in this verse in 1 Corinthians that I read, he says, If that work, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. So those that survive, that'll be the right work, the right deeds, the right actions, the right those things, the right use of talents, the right motive, doing the things that are the will of God, keeping his laws. This is the time when Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And you know what the reward will be? You guys remember what the reward will be? What will be the reward? What will we receive? Crowns, right? We receive.
receive crowns. It would be crowns. 2 Timothy 4 8. Henceforth, Paul says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What these crowns are going to do is give us greater ability to honor and glorify God. Remember, that's why we want them. It's not so we can walk around and barely stand up because our crown's so heavy, right? <laughs> Be like Mr. T. All these gold chains around. That's not why we want them, right? Because what are we going to do with those things? Once we, as soon as we get them, what are we going to do? We're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. Because why? Because it all belongs to him anyway. It is for his glory. It is for, yes, it says we'll receive the reward, but it's for him. It's his reward here. For apart from you, I can do nothing. Here you go. Revelations 4, chapter 8 through 11 describes that event. It says, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within, and the day and night will never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. And then he says, If anybody's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. You ever heard of the words by your hair on the chinny chin chin? <laughs> Second John 1 8 says, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. And that's because Christ is worth it. Amen. That's because Christ is worth it. Warren Rearsby has this quote that should help us. Because we live in a world that is opposite of this, right? Which again, that should not surprise us that God is the opposite of the world. We should never be surprised by that. Like, we should already like know. This is if the world says this, then God is saying something different. I promise. Let's go figure that out. But Warren Risby says this in his book, Be Wise. He says, the world depends on. Promotion, prestige, not prestige. Um, the world depends on promotion, prestige, and the influence of money and important people. The church depends on prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, humility, sacrifice, and service. The church that imitates the world may seem to succeed in time, but will but it will turn to ashes in eternity. What a lesson for us to learn. Because isn't it, I mean, isn't it easy as Christians to be caught up in a church that has all these other things, that has these worldly things? Right? We, I mean, we've had people come to this church wanting worldly things. Guess what? They're not here. They're not here. They own. Right? All right, verse 20. We're going to close. Verse 20. So Jesus goes on in verse 20, and he makes this bold statement, right? I mean, he's got a, he's got a, a, a really diverse audience listening to him. And he says these words, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know how much that means to you and I because we we don't necessarily have scribes and Pharisees. 
But we, would, we do have those who would uh, label themselves as experts of this, right? Experts of the Bible. That's a dangerous word. I think if, if anything that anybody can ever achieve of the Bible is that you're a studier of it. You're not an expert of it. I, I've, uh, anyway, that word is thrown around a lot. Expert, right? Um, but if you had experts in the time, it would have been the scribes and the Pharisees. They, they would have been the most knowledgeable about the law. So therefore, you would think because they were the most knowledgeable about the law, they were able to keep it better. I mean, isn't that the facade that you and I are get fooled with sometimes? Like, because we're so impressed by one guy's so-called knowledge of the Bible, we think that his character is up here too. But do you know that that gets proven wrong all the time? Amen. To the detriment of the church? <laughs> and the church suffers for it? I gotta just tell you, hey, beware. Like a good, I, hey, I know that there's good teachers out there and I celebrate them and I've learned a lot from them. I, I get it. But we can never put them in a place where they don't belong. Right. They are men who have the gift of studying and the gift of communicating which they didn't, they weren't born with. I mean, God gave them that, right? God gave them that. They're responsible for how they used it, though. Right? But unless, he says, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus saying about scribes and Pharisees? He's saying they're, they're going to hell. That's what Jesus just said. They are going to hell. As, if, as their state right now, that's where they're headed. Matthew uh, chapter 23, verses 27 through 28, and the warnings to scribes and Pharisees, there's a whole bunch of these here, but he says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he calls them. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful. But within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus is saying there's something about those kinds of people. Those are not people that are typically going to be in heaven. In Romans uh, chapter 10, verses uh, 3 through 4, Paul says again to the Roman church, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness to everyone who believes. So again, they were... These, these people that God, that Jesus is describing here, these scribes and Pharisees, they were depending on the law to create righteousness in them, we, which we spend a lot of time on already today. They can't do that. And that's why. That's why they're not going to heaven. is because they're dependent upon their strict obedience of the law. But that's not God's standards. Is God's standard strict obedience of the law? No, God's standard is perfection. Perfection. Which no one can attain. In Romans chapter 9, verse 31 through 33, Paul again says, But that Israel who poured, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why, Paul says? Because they did not pursue it by what? By faith. But as if it were based on works. <laughs> So again, they, they, they got the system out of order. They, they got it wrong. They, they, it got flipped around. It got to be a place where it honored men instead of honored God. I mean, really, if I, if, I'm gonna, if I make a system that says I am greater because I know all the laws and I keep all the laws, that is a man-made system. Where God says, no one can keep all the law, so therefore I am greater. I came and did it for you. Have faith in me. 
And in that righteousness, he goes on to say, They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. It is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Galatians 3, 10 through 11. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a what? A curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by what? By faith. And then James 2, 10. Forever keeps the whole law, but falls at Fail, sorry, in one point has become guilty of how much of it? All of it. All of it. That's what perfection means. That's the standard of God. Jesus says it to Nicodemus this way. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and of the spirit. Unless one is, then he cannot enter the kingdom of God. by faith in Jesus Christ and finally Philippians 3 9 and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith that perfection that God requires depends on faith So that brings us to this. We don't follow the law to become righteous. We follow the law because we have been made righteous. It's about the, it's about the motivation. It's about the reason why. And we follow the law because we follow Jesus. A.W. Tozer, anybody heard of A.W. Tozer? Yeah. He's long passed away. But he was preaching in the in the times that you and I would think would be the golden years of the United States, like the United States. Like, right? And this is what he had to say about the time frame in which he preached in. He says this. He says the horrible travesty we have in America today is Christianity without holiness. And we look at those times as if they were great. <laughs> and that's what he's, I wonder what he would say now. You know, it, it would probably be the same thing. He might use a lot of other words around it, but I don't think his statement would change very much. Can we, can we just say that, that that statement not be true for here? Can we can we just agree on can we agree on that together today? I mean, like really. You know how some of you guys have struggled, and I know that um, I, mean, I mean, there's not there's not one of you. In fact, even the lady that I talked to this last week, their struggle with church is people. Amen. And I know that um, that people can um, they can motivate us or demotivate us, right? But that's only because we allow them to. Can, can, can we just get to a place where, where we allow God to, to motivate us? Can we get to a place where his love motivates us and not let people make us on a scale of up and downs? Could, could, we, um, could we love each other by doing God's word around each other? And help each other. I think we can. With God's help, right? Through the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys so much for being here today. And I really thank you for uh, your attention in, um, in this matter. And uh, we're going to be dismissed. And we're going to go to the back for Father's Day lunch. I hope you guys have a great rest of the Father's Day. I hope it's awesome. I hope that you're able to take some truths of God's word back with you today as you leave and as we go and be salt and light to the rest of the world. Uh, so again, let's stand and we'll be... Um
will be dismissed. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you again so much for today. And God, we thank you that you are um, a good and perfect Father. God, we thank you that you gave us boundaries to which to live our lives because you love us and you care for us. So God, thank you for doing that. And God, help us, help us to stay within those boundaries. And most of all, God, we ask that you help us to love each other well. For that's what you've done for us and to us. God, we exist because of you. And we're thankful for you. We're thankful for this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.